bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Holland Blurview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard, and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today's webinar is titled, Our Epic Journey Across Canada to Improve Palliative Care for Children with Cancer. All right, so today's a great opportunity to welcome back a familiar voice to the CAFC Presents stage, as well as, as uh, welcome a new voice. Uh, Dr. Kim Widger uh, joined us uh, a couple of years ago with a session on related to children's pain as it relates to pediatric palliative care. And of course, that session is available on the Knowledge Exchange Network. If you do a quick search, I'm sure you'll be able to find it and hear some of the great work that she did way back then. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome her back to the stage uh, and hear about what she's uh, doing now. And Dr. Uh, Kim Widger is an assistant professor in the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto and a nursing research associate, associate with the Pediatric Advanced Care Team at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And her research is focused on enhancing the quality of palliative care for children and their families. And joining uh, Kim today is Dr. Adam Rappaport who is the medical director of the pediatric advanced team at uh, pediatric advanced care team at the hospital for sick children and of Emily's house children's hospice in all in Toronto and he's also an assistant professor in the department of pediatrics and family and community medicine at the University of Toronto so it's my uh, pleasure to hand the uh, virtual podium first over to Dr. Adam Rappaport over to you Adam thanks Doug uh, you can hear me okay I'm gonna assume that's a yes yeah. Yeah. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Kim and I are really excited to share the work that we've been doing for the last couple of years. Uh, and as Doug mentioned, we've entitled our uh, presentation, Our Epic Journey Across Canada to Improve Palliative Care for Children with Cancer. And I hope that will become clear as to why we chose that title in just a few minutes. There we go. So first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, the funding agency that made all of our work possible. We're really grateful to them. And I'd like to introduce you to our project team. So uh, up at the top there, you see Kim and myself, who are the co-PIs on this project. Uh, but hopefully you see some other familiar face faces on the project team. Eric Buffet is um, the head of uh, pediatric neuro-oncology program here at SickKids. Stefan Friedrichsdorf is uh, the head of the palliative care service and the pain team in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mark Greenberg is uh, the ex-head of POGO, still uh, very much involved in POGO, and a, a former pediatric oncologist here at SickKids. Dr. Amna Hussein is a palliative care physician at the Temi Latner Center for Palliative Care, uh, a very large home care organization serving the greater Toronto area. Dr. Stephen Lieben is a palliative care, pediatric palliative care physician at Montreal Children's Hospital. Jason Pohl is a statistician um, who, works at, who is affiliated with POGO. Hal Seiden is the head of pediatric palliative care at Canuck Place Children's Hospice in uh, Vancouver and is, of course, affiliated with BC Children's Hospital. Jim Whitlock is the head of the Division of Oncology here at SickKids Hospital. And Joanne Wolf is a pediatric palliative care uh, provider and director of the team in uh, Boston, Boston Children's. So we've got a great team um, spanning the country, a lot of local representation, and also partners in the U.S. Um, and uh, we, it's been a pleasure to work with these people and to develop this, this project that we're going to spend the next, next little while telling you all about. Um, but we would be remiss not to mention our other partners. So in order to get the grant, we had to show that there was wide partnership supporting our idea. And we were lucky enough to have the support of seven different ministries of health, all of whom wrote letters of support to uh, CPAC, the funding organization. We have uh, family advocacy groups, 
groups from across Canada uh, representing pediatric oncology. We have palliative care organizations uh, from across the country, uh, oncology education groups like the D'Souza Institute, and uh, general pediatric uh, organizations such as CAPC uh, that lended our support, and we are extremely grateful for that. Uh, there is no doubt in our minds that without the support of all of these organizations, uh, we wouldn't be on the phone right now being able to tell you about this project. So as far as the webinar objectives go, uh, really we're hoping to provide an overview of what, what our project is. Uh, the bulk of our time together is going to be reviewing some of the baseline data that we've uh, amassed uh, to date. We'll review some of the activities completed so far with respect to the project, specifically in the areas of education and quality improvement, and then we'll just talk briefly about the next steps, what's up ahead. So with respect to background, um, you know, Kim and I came to, to this project idea with an understanding that the principles of palliative care should be integrated right from diagnosis. Uh, for children with cancer, and really for children with life-limiting or life-threatening conditions uh, all across the spectrum. This isn't just our understanding. This, this sort of idea that the principles of palliative care should be integrated early on is really gaining traction in the medical literature, particularly in the oncology literature. And uh, I'm going to highlight the word principles in this statement because this is different from the subspecialty of pediatric palliative care. We're not saying that there is necessarily a role for pediatric palliative care physicians like myself or uh, subspecialty teams. There may or may not be. Um, but what we are saying is that the principles of palliative care, the idea that we do whatever we can to maximize quality of life, that we look to minimize suffering, that we aim to support children and families who have serious illnesses or life-threatening diagnoses. These are things that is recognized in 2016 that should be integrated early on by all healthcare providers who are involved in the care of these children. Um, but while that is a, a sort of a, a statement that's gaining traction and acceptance very widely, there is a, a growing body of research that's showing us that health professionals, all types of health professionals, receive little training in palliative and end-of-life care. Um, specifically, we've, there are studies that have shown that parents report palliative and end-of-life care is less than optimal in the areas of symptom management for their children with cancer, around the ideas of communication, specifically about prognosis, but other areas of communication as well. Sibling support is an area that comes up frequently in the literature that seems to be lacking, but it is a, a very strong tenet of uh, palliative care principles. And the overall use of uh, palliative care team resources and referrals to palliative care teams uh, is something that um, parents feel doesn't happen enough, and when it does happen, it's happening too late. So keeping those things in mind, Kim and I set out to uh, look to create a project whose number one objective was to enhance the quality of palliative care provided to children with cancer and their families. And in order to accomplish this objective, we had two main, um, two main goals or, or two main processes. Number one, uh, we were going to implement a national rollout of the education in palliative and end-of-life care for pediatrics curriculum. That's a mouthful, so uh, it's been shortened to Epic Peds curriculum. And I'm going to spend the next little while telling you a little bit more about what Epic Peds is and how we sought to accomplish this national rollout. But of course, we needed to do more than just um, rolling out this curriculum. We wanted to assess what the impact of this rollout was, specifically in four key areas how it affected the quality of palliative care that children and families received, um, how we sort of did in, in the area of knowledge dissemination outcomes. Did, did this uh, rollout accomplish the things that we wanted and reach the people we wanted across the national spectrum? We wanted to see how, um, how it affected the knowledge of healthcare professionals who participated in the rollout, and ultimately we were hoping to see practice changes as a result, as a result of this as well. We're going to touch upon each of these areas, but the one that we've done the most work to date is looking at the quality of palliative care 
Um, at this point in the project, which extends from January 2014 to January 2017, so we're about a little bit more than midway, uh, most of what we have to share with you today is the, the baseline data, which we are going to be using, of course, to compare um, by collecting post data and, and seeing if, if our rollout has made any difference in these areas. So I want to take the next little bit of time talking about Epic Peds. Uh, this is a curriculum. I think that's the easiest word to describe it, but it's so much more than a curriculum. But this is a curriculum that was developed primarily by Stefan Friedrichsdorf, who you saw was a project team member of ours. Um, Stefan had his own uh, group that helped him do this as part of a, a grant from the National Institute of Cancer in the U.S. And Epic Peds follows a long line of other Epic curricula that uh, people on this line may be uh, familiar with. In fact, the first Epic curriculum, uh, so which was just a general uh, curriculum on uh, education and palliative and end of life care, was started in the 1990s, and it was um, it was felt by the National Institute of Cancer and the National Institute of Health to be a huge success, and uh, it was based out of Chicago from Northwestern University. And because of its large success, uh, there started to be the creation of um, epics in specific areas, such as emergency medicine, epic oncology, and now epic pediatrics. So Stefan uh, led this effort to create epic peds, um, probably started about 10 years ago now, maybe a little bit less. The curriculum was created by experts in pediatric hematology oncology as well as palliative care, and there was uh, some great representation from uh, Canadians on that uh, curriculum panel as well. The curriculum itself, um, primarily because of the grant that Stefan got, was uh, focused on pediatric oncology. But the, the individuals that created this knew that it would have much more relevance beyond oncology, um, and so uh, it, it is not oncology specific, even though there was a, a strong representation from hematologists, oncologists on the committees that created this. As I mentioned, it, it's more than just a curriculum, uh, Epic Peds. It's not just about teaching people uh, what pediatric palliative care is and, and about specific areas of pediatric palliative care, the whole focus is on a train-the-trainer mod, uh, model. So people who experience the EPIC uh, rollout or, or who get trained in EPIC um, are, are trained a lot not only in the material, but how to use the material most effectively to teach participants. And uh, we're going to explain that a little bit more as we go on. In addition, it's not, um, it's not only about um, enhancing people's knowledge who go through the training. It also, uh, Epic Peds encourages uh, a sort of quality improvement aspect, which they call their TIPS kit, which is, uh, stands for Tailored Implementation of Practice Standards. And as part of the, um, this original Epic Peds project stemming from the U.S., they created one TIPS kit which involved using uh, the Memorial Symptom Assessment Scale, or the MSAS, to look at the symptoms that children with cancer are experiencing throughout their cancer experience. Um, and so that was one uh, tips kit that they came up with, that they presented. They did a lot of teaching to, to EPIC uh, pediatric curriculum attendees about what quality improvement initiatives are, and they gave this uh, tips kit which is basically a quality improvement project in a box to all participants, uh, encouraging them when they go back home to wherever it is that they're from, that they look to implement uh, this particular TIPS kit, uh, which encourages symptom management, uh, symptom assessment uh, of children. So you can see these two um, little uh, cartoons or, or graphics at the bottom of the slide here. Um, Epic Peds is really focused on online module training, so most of it is done online, uh, where the, the uh, would-be trainers go through these modules. They, they take on average about an hour. There is a pre-test and a post-test. Um, there uh, is multimedia involved. Um, and so the, the users, the learners, go through a, a very intensive training at their own time. Um, and then there is a one-day face-to-face conference, and I'll tell you a little bit more about both these things on the next couple slides. 
So first of all, I, I'm not going to go through this list. You can take a look at it yourself. But these are some of the online modules. Uh, there, there's about 18 or 19. I think we've listed 18 here. I think there was a 19th one added that's not on this list. You can see that uh, the online modules are heavily represented on uh, symptoms. Um, and that's because the EPIC pediatric curriculum is really targeting physicians and advanced practice nurses, such as nurse practitioners. Um, but there are also psychosocial modules and general communication modules as well. Um, and so EPIC PEDS does also target social workers, child life specialists have attended these things, um, and other members of the large interprofessional team that would be involved in the care of children with cancer. And so again, people wanting to become an EPIC, uh, EPIC PEDS trainer go through all these on online modules to begin with at their own pace and at their own time. But eventually, uh, in order to um, get that EPIC PEDS trainer status, um, all would-be trainers have to participate in a face-to-face -face day. It's a one-day thing, and listed on this slide are the five modules that, um, that uh, what are called master facilitators go through with all these trainers in person. Um, the thing to mention about this face-to-face -face training is the, the emphasis is not so much on the content of the modules, but how to teach these modules. So the face-to-face -face training, um, we recognize that all these people now uh, participating are hopefully becoming experts in the content material that's been presented. But uh, this day is really about role modeling how EPIC pediatrics can be used and how um, to teach it most effectively. And that, that's really the focus of this one day in-person training. This is an example of what a slide looks like uh, that you get from uh, the EPIC pediatrics uh, curriculum. So once you go through, you really get access to this what's called accordion curriculum. In fact, you get a ton of material. You get slides, different texts, uh, recommended teaching strategies, access to videos, um, ideas about how to do role plays, et cetera. So you get this incredibly large amount of material. And the reason why it's uh, referred to as a, an accordion curriculum is it's up to the trainer themselves to decide how much to use, when to use it, do I want to teach this module? Do I want to you know, put together three modules? How do I want to edit the slides to make it um, my own? And, and that was one of the things that Kim and I were really drawn to about the EPIC pediatrics curriculum. I think a lot of people might be wondering, why did you choose this particular curriculum uh, to, to roll out across Canada? In addition to it being the most recent peer-reviewed content that's out there and available right now, um, it was because the creators of Epic Peds recognized that um, you know, it, it should be up to the actual person teaching the content to determine how to use it when they're teaching and what to use. Um, they, the Epic Peds curriculum is not a rigid curriculum. Uh, so as long as they use slides that have this general background that you see here with the uh, footer at the bottom explaining that it is part of Epic Peds, um, and sort of the, this co general color scheme, um, users are welcome and encouraged to edit the slides as they want to really make it their own because it's very hard to um, present somebody else's work. But I think having that, that flexibility to edit it, cut out the slides that you want, but having somewhere to start is, is a really nice way to do things. Um, and so Epic Peds as a result is something that is very adaptable for a variety of audiences different backgrounds, and, and is really geared and targeting the various interprofessional people that would be um, benefiting from this material. So I, we've talked a little bit about what EPIC Pediatrics, uh, the, the curriculum is, um, but I think the question that really remains uh, is, does it work? We, we know there are actually publications that EPIC not the pediatric one, but that original um, adult EPIC has been widely disseminated. In fact, the original creators of EPIC estimate that um, more than a million people have sort of been touched by EPIC 
uh, on an international level now by, by the year 2016. So we know it's been widely disseminated um, and there's also evidence to show that it does improve knowledge and attitudes of the trainers who participate in and become EPIC trainers. There are general reports of practice improvement and, and that's done on a self-report. So those people who went on to become EPIC trainers say, yeah, this is this has affected my practice and I think it's better as a result. Um, and, and there are sort of general comments that the train the trainer model, this idea that you don't just give someone a curriculum, but you teach them how to teach the curriculum so that it can get out there more broadly, that these are, this sort of model of education is, it has been linked to improve patient outcomes as a whole. But nobody has sort of answered the question specifically uh, of what the impact is on patient outcomes um, and, and I think more specifically for Kim and I, uh, Kim and my desire uh, about whether or not Epic Peds actually makes a difference to the care that we give to patients and families. And, and so that was a big part of what we set out to investigate. In order to achieve that, you know, in order to, to see that this really does have an impact, Kim and I felt that it would be wise to tweak some of the original Epic Peds um, mandates. So I, I've already shared with you how Epic Peds has, uh, you know, what their model is, this idea of online modules and a one-day face-to-face training. Anybody can sign up to, to become an Epic Peds trainer um, in the U.S., which has been where it's been based out of. They sort of have these one-day face-to-face workshops um, tied to very large uh, pediatric oncology conferences or pediatric palliative care conferences. It's sort of a, a one-day extra at the beginning or at the tail end of the conference, uh, a one-day extra seminar. And so individuals like myself could attend those things after doing the online modules. I could become a certified Epic Peds trainer. Um, and then it's up to me with what I do with it. I, I can go home to Toronto and I might just treat it as CME for myself and never use this stuff again. Or I might be really gung-ho and, and really get out there and use this curriculum, all these materials that I've gained, um, and get out there and really uh, teach it. But there was really no accountability. And, and Kim and I thought there were ways that we could sort of tweak the program to ensure that it had, um, or, or hopefully to ensure that it had a, a more beneficial effect and, uh, and a more beneficial impact. And so here's some of the things we did. I, I mentioned that as part of Epic Peds, right from the get-go, there is a, a bit of an emphasis on quality improvement uh, with this TIPS kit or quality improvement project in a box. They, they made one um, QI project, as I mentioned, on the MSES, the Memorial Symptom Assessment Scale. We felt that it would be beneficial to create other projects as well to give um, uh, potential Epic Peds trainers more of a variety. Um, and so we created two new tips kits, one on bereavement follow-up for uh, families when a child dies, and one on having larger goal of care discussions. Um, but we didn't limit it to this as well. Uh, we, we wanted people who participated in our national training system to be able to come up with their own uh, quality improvement projects if they felt that something different would work better in their particular region. So we were really flexible on this and we spent a lot more time as well teaching about quality improvement projects, giving time um, for people to actually create quality improvement projects when they go back home as well. Um, in addition, rather than having individual healthcare providers become Epic Peds trainers, we thought it would be much more effective to create regional teams. Um, and so regional teams consisted of three to five healthcare professionals coming from pediatric oncology, palliative care, and that might be pediatric or adult palliative care, and the community. And so every major pediatric oncology center from across Canada was tasked with forming a regional team. And so rather than having individuals become Epic Pediatric Trainers, we created these regional teams of Epic Pediatric Trainers who would represent, you know, a various uh, institution or a region. So I'll, I'll pick Ottawa, for example. Uh, the Ottawa regional team came together 
sat at a round table for two days at our face-to-face -face, uh, teaching seminars and really sort of bonded as a team. They looked together at what were the challenges in their region, what are the benefits, how are we going to go back as a team and really take this epic pediatrics curriculum to the highest level and, and get the most out of it? What was going to be our strategy when we get back to really disseminate this new curriculum widely? And what could we do in terms of a quality improvement project that would be really meaningful in our region um, and, and that, would be, that would work well? As I've already alluded to, one of the things we thought that we needed to do to really uh, drive this home and create a cohesive regional team was to go from a one-day face-to-face training session to two days and um, you know, really create these teams uh, that were going to be more than just Epic Pete's trainers but become regional champions in pediatric palliative care. And finally, um, you know, the, the, the original Epic Peds curriculum that I, I initially described in the U.S. Uh, was a one-time thing. You go, you become a trainer, and then you go back home. And uh, you may get the odd email from Epic Pediatrics checking in, uh, but that was it. As I mentioned, what you do with it is, is what you choose. Kim and I and our project team decided that to really make this work, we needed to provide ongoing support for these regional teams to encourage them to continue uh, to you know, really get this information out there, to find out what challenges they were having with their, uh, their local um, or regional rollout and expansion, um, and to help them uh, with ideas that we've learned from other regional teams and to keep everybody connected. So as a result, uh, as part of this project, we have quarterly uh, conference calls with these regional team members, sort of as a check-in to see how things are going um, and to uh, help problem solve, to encourage, um, and to share ideas. This is a, a schematic really showing what this Epic Peds rollout was going to be as part of our project. So looking at the top of this pyramid, uh, and this is using the Epic Pediatric language, the, at the top of the pyramid, Epic Peds has what's called master facilitators. These are the individuals that have reached a level of competency in Epic Peds uh, and training that they are able to train would-be Epic trainers. And so there were a number of Epic Pediatric Master Facilitators in the U.S. Uh, when, we, when we sought to start this project. There were no Master Facilitators in Canada. And so we uh, set out to create, we thought it would be important to have Canadian Master Facilitators, and we set, set out to uh, have five of them roughly across Canada. As I mentioned, we wanted to create these regional team of Epic Pediatric Trainers, and they were going to be associated or based out of uh, or, or sort of a, um, affiliated with the six pediatric oncology programs um, from across Canada, excuse me, 16 pediatric oncology programs from across Canada. The reason why we say three to five is some of the programs are smaller than others, and not every one of them could afford to have representation of two oncology team members, let's say a, a physician and a advanced practice nurse. Some of them could only afford one. Some of the regions that we worked with had no representation from palliative care. This was going to be the project that really sp spurred it on. Um, so we, we left it up to the regional team members and, and the institutions to come up with who are the right people to create um, and to represent uh, the, their regional teams. But at the end, we were hoping to have anywhere from about 40 to 80 trainers across Canada when all was said and done. These trainers would then go back to their institutions to their region and then disseminate the epic pediatric curriculum widely. They would go out there and sort of spread the gospel, if you will, do the teaching. And our hope was that each region would um, sort of educate 40 or more healthcare professionals that are involved with children with cancer. That was it. Uh, we thought that that number made sense. We thought it was um, conservative in some respects, but also ambitious in some respects. And if, if we met this goal, by the end of this project, 600 or more end users, 600 or more people who work with children with cancer would benefit uh, or would have been touched by some form of Epic Peds education. 
And uh, towards the end of this presentation, we're going to let you know how we've done with respect to achieving this goal as you see here in the pyramid. For those of you who like schematics, uh, I, I'm going to describe that another way. Hopefully this, um, this representation of Canada is familiar to all of you. What we were hoping is that uh, the first step in this um, Epic Peds curriculum rollout would be to create these regional teams that you can see represented here across Canada. All of them were going to be affiliated with the 16 major oncology centers. Um, now this is probably a good time to mention that unfortunately we only were able to work with 15 oncology centers. Uh, the center of Sherbrooke in Quebec was just too small and they, they were unable to give the resources that would be required to um, participate in the training because there would be nobody to cover the oncology or palliative care programs. But uh, I am pleased that we were able to get um, all 15 centers from coast to coast to participate in this. And they would then go back home as I mentioned and if all worked well, we would cover uh, the country as you can see here with Epic Peds end users. That is people who had participated in the Epic curriculum in some level and uh, had been educated as a result. Whoops. So at this point I'm going to pause Doug and just see if anybody has any questions. I hope I was clear about what we were doing, what we were after. Of course the, the next big part that we're going to talk about is then uh, the assessment itself and how we, we've determined uh, whether or not that's worked and, and what our baseline data is. But we'll, Kim and I would just like to pause here to see if anybody has any questions. All right, thank you, uh, Adam. Uh, great presentation. It's certainly very, very clear on, on what you guys have accomplished today, and that's really fantastic, and a great vision uh, that you've displayed on the map there. Uh, there haven't been any questions uh, come in yet, but that's my op opportunity to remind the audience, type any questions that you do have into that question box as you think of them so you don't forget, and so that we have them uh, ready for the next time uh, Kim and Adam are ready to take questions. So uh, so with that, we'll, we'll just continue on with the presentation and, and, again, invite people to type those questions in as they think of them. Great, so I'm going to actually take over now and tell you about uh, how we were assessing the impact of our project. So Adam touched on this at the beginning, but just as a reminder, we were looking at sort of four key areas. The first being the quality of palliative care for children with cancer and their families. Then looking at whether or not we achieved our knowledge dissemination outcomes, which is really whether or not we actually got the map of Canada that, uh, that Adam was just showing you looking at whether we had an impact on the knowledge of health professionals, and then whether or not the regional teams were able to go back and actually implement those quality improvement projects to have some practice changes actually happen locally. And what I'm going to focus on primarily is this quality of palliative care piece. So as Adam said, we have collected data across um, all 15 sites looking at the quality of palliative care sort of at the beginning of this project before we started our rollout of Epic Peds and then we will be looking at it again actually this fall to see whether or not our rollout has actually had uh, an impact. So in terms of the quality of palliative care, like I said, we're looking at a cross-sectional view of the quality before and after. We did our pre-test or um, beginning data collection, baseline data collection, from May to, of 2015 to March of 2016. And like I said, we'll be doing some post-testing this fall. We had four different sources of data that we were collecting as part of this assessment. So we did surveys with children on active treatment, surveys with parents of children on active treatment, surveys with bereaved parents, and then chart reviews of deceased patients. And I'll go through each of those uh, in turn. The data that I'm going to be presenting shortly is actually from 10 of the participating sites. Uh, there were some delays at the last five and so we decided to go ahead with the analysis of these first 10 so that we would be able to present this to you, but we do have data from all 15 sites. So first of all, the children on active treatment. So just like Adam said at the beginning, we, we take this very broad view of palliative care and that the principles of palliative care should be incorporated right from diagnosis. So we wanted to, to include any child who has cancer essentially. Uh, and we wanted to be sure that we have the children's voices. So our definition of 
of being on active treatment was that children or adolescents were at least a month from diagnosis, that they are receiving cancer-directed therapy or have active disease or are within sort of three months of completing, successfully completing their cancer treatments and are cancer-free. And the surveys that we used with the children are really validated just for children from age 7 up to 18. So that is the group that we looked at. And you can see here that across the 10 sites that we're reporting on so far, we had 43 children in the younger age group, so that's age 7 to 12 years of age. And we had 53 children in the adolescent group, so the older kids age 13 to 19. And you can see that across those two age groups, there really was a wide range of diagnoses, which fits exactly with the, sort of the wide range of types of cancers that kids actually get. So we had a nice representation there. The assessment that we did, we used the Memorial Symptom Assessment Scale. This scale asks about 22 different symptoms and whether or not the child had them in the last sort of week, so the week prior to doing the actual survey. We've listed the symptoms here, and this is just for the older kids. So we've listed them here in terms of how frequently the child reported the symptoms. So 52% of our sample reported that they had a lack of energy. 49% said that they had nausea. Then the bars going out beside that, the blue bars at the top, are about how much that symptom sort of interfered with their life. So it's a combination of how frequently they get the symptom, how severe it is, and how, it, how much it bothers them. So if, as you look down, you can see that something like weight loss is not very highly reported and doesn't really bother kids too much. Something like difficulty sleeping is reported by less of the kids. Only 26% said they had that. But when they have it, it really is bothersome, so showing a score higher than two. Uh, then the red bars on the bottom show sort of total scores for sort of all of the physical symptoms taken together and a slightly higher score for the psychological symptoms, showing that those are a bit more, more bothersome. And just for comparison, I went back to the scores uh, that were obtained by a similar group of children back when this tool was first developed uh, by John Collins back around 2000. And our actual scores are a bit higher than what he found. So the score for total that he found was, or sorry, our score was 1.75 and his was only 0.93 and even lower when he was looking at just kids who were outpatient. So it seems that our scores show a higher level of um, symptom prevalence and distress caused by the symptoms than what he had found. But certainly care has changed even over the last 15 years. In some ways I think we've got better at uh, potentially managing some of these symptoms. Uh, but on the other hand, we give a lot of very intense treatments that have um, improved sur survival rates for children. So then moving on to the younger children. So the younger children are asked about a few less symptoms, so only eight symptoms. Uh, they're laid out here for you, and, but, but sort of similar idea that they're asked about whether or not they have the symptom and then how, much, how severe it is and how much it really bothers them. And similarly, comparing back to the original uh, validation of the instrument, our sample seem to have uh, a higher proportion of kids that report worry. So 27% of our sample reported worry, whereas back in 2000, only 20% said that they were worried. Sadness in our group is 22%, whereas in 2000, it was only 10%. But our sample reported much less frequency of being tired, so only 20% for us whereas it was 35% in, in the earlier sample. So again, changes over time uh, may be due to just changes in the treatments. And of course, what we are most interested in once we collect all this data again is whether there are changes within our own sample. So the kids that we talked to this fall see how their uh, scores compare with these children that we talked to over the last year. 
So in addition to asking about symptoms, we also asked the kids about quality of life. And we used an instrument called the PEDS QL, which is a very well-established instrument. The items in the physical subscale, so that's the first set of bars, are all about health and activities. So for example, asking questions about whether or not it's hard for the child to run, whether it's hard for them to lift something heavy. Well, the psychosocial ones are more about feelings, so whether or not they feel afraid, sad, angry, whether they worry about what will happen to them. Then questions about getting along with others, so whether or not they're teased, whether or not they have friends. And finally, about school. So is it hard to pay attention in class? Is it hard to keep up with your schoolwork? So these bars show the mean score out of 100 for the older children in blue and then the younger children are in red. So in terms of the physical quality of life, the psychosocial quality of life, and then the total score for both of those sort of subscales. So you can see that the older children tend to overall report a lower quality of life, uh, lower in the older children than in the younger children. And then again, going back to sort of the norms that are published for these scales, because you might think, well, most, most adolescents probably have that adolescent angst and would not rate their quality of life as high as, um, as kids, and whether kids with cancer, how they actually compare to sort of typical kids who don't have uh, an illness. So typical kids in, the, in all three areas, the normal scores are sort of around 83 to 84, so certainly children with cancer score younger than that. And the typical scores for a child with cancer, though, previously have been, have been scored at 72, where our scores are certainly a bit lower than that, and particularly the adolescents score quite a bit lower than that. So at the end of each of these scales, so we went through the Memorial Symptom Assessment Scale and then asked the kids, how often are you asked these kinds of questions? So trying to get at how often the kids felt that, that we're actually assessing their symptoms. So less than 5% said that they're never or almost never asked about symptoms. However, when we got to the end of the quality of life scale and similarly said, now how often do health professionals ask you these kinds of questions, almost 40% said that they're never or almost never asked about their quality of life. And so, of course, we feel that if you're not asking about it, it's hard to actually try and do anything to address it. And as you saw, the scores uh, are a little bit lower than what we might expect in this population. So I might just pause there, actually, uh, to see if there's any questions about uh, the surveys that we actually did with kids who are on active treatment. All right, so once again, a chance to uh, ask questions. Again, we're a quiet audience today, uh, but people are probably still sort of mulling over th these graphs you just presented. That's really, really quite interesting uh, and impactful data you're showing there, particularly about never being asked about these uh, these uh, the, the, these symptoms related to quality of life. So I'm sure people are still processing that, so uh, we'll give them another few uh, minutes to type in their questions and go on with the presentation while we're waiting. Okay, sounds good. So I'll give everyone a heads up that I'll sort of stop after each. So I'm going to talk about the parents' perspective next, and then I'll pause again, and then talk about brief parents, a pause, and then talk about our chart reviews. So so you have the heads up um, that you can get your questions in there. So moving on to quality of care, and this is the perspective of parents who have a child on active treatment. So whereas we were only able to talk to kids older than seven uh, to ask them for their own reports of what their symptoms were like, when we were talking to the parents, the, the parent could be of a child of any age. So we certainly would have potentially parents of infants who actually completed these surveys as well. So this represents data from 245 parents across the 10 sites who completed our survey focused really on quality of care. So there were four main subscales that are listed there in the survey. So it was about relationship between the family and the health professionals the involvement of parents in the care that was being provided, information that was shared among the health professionals, and we do have more detailed questions about information shared between the health professionals and the family members, and then the support given to siblings. So each subscale has an average score out of four, so four is the maximum score that, that, um, 
that you can get. And then we have an overall item that we asked again at the end of the survey that was just sort of a global, you know, tell us about the overall quality of care that you, you feel your family has achieved. And again, scored that out of four. So you can see looking across these different subscales, the support for siblings really comes out as the lowest piece. Now what we wanted to do uh, across the sites with this, because we had 245 parents, we could actually break the results down by sites because in some degree in isolation these numbers don't mean a lot. I can't sort of say that you know every site should be aiming to get at least 3.5 or 3.75. It's more about benchmarking across the sites. So I can't tell you which site is which in terms of the number. We need to keep that piece uh, anonymized. But just to show you that there is some variation across the sites. And what we've done now is actually gone back to each site. They get to know which bar is their own site so that they can kind of see how they stack up against everybody else to know maybe what areas they need to work on. So I just want to go through each one of these uh, and tell you a little bit more about the kinds of questions that we asked. So in terms of relationships with health professionals, we asked about things like whether or not health professionals communicate well with the parent, the child, the family, how often the family feels a close connection to the health professionals providing care to the child, how much trust there is, and how often families experience acts of kindness from health professionals. So you can see the scores are certainly quite high, but there is some um, variation across the site. Then moving on to the subscale looking at involving parents in the care, the kinds of questions we were asking here are how often do health professionals ask for your opinions or concerns about your child? How often do you feel trusted as the expert on your child? How often do health professionals respect your wishes, make you feel like you are a good parent, and involve you in your child's care to the degree that you want to be? And so again, a bit of variation uh, across all of the sites in terms of this subscale. Similar variation uh, across looking at the information that's shared among health professionals. And the questions we asked here were around whether or not the information seems to be consistent from one health professional to the next. Do parents feel that information is appropriately shared among health professionals? And how often does it seem that the health professionals are all really working together and planning together so that they're working towards the same goals? Then the sibling score or sibling subscale, which as you saw before is the lowest across all of the sites and also seem to have the most variation across sites. So the questions in here, how often do health professionals provide the right amount of overall support to your other children? How often do they guide you on how to support your other children? And how often do they allow and encourage your other children to visit if your child is in the hospital? Now at the end of the parent survey, we also just asked some open-ended questions about any other sort of comments that they want to provide. So just want to highlight some of the positive things that parents said. So the staff have been fantastic. They take a lot of care of the children and really take an interest in families as well. We are thrilled with the care that our child is receiving. Child life specialists are truly wonderful. We love our oncology team. I know we can approach our team at any time and they have addressed many concerns for us. And then an overall, keep up the hard work for families and children. Then looking more specifically at some of the challenges or areas for improvement that parents identified. I wish communication between us and the doctors happened more frequently when we are not an inpatient. We tend to be left in the dark and not knowing what's going on until we get here, which could be months between visits, so looking for test results and plans ahead. Sometimes there are delays in communication between doctors and nurses, which results in delays in care. And finally, twice Invasive procedures have been longer and more traumatizing than needed because training needs were more important than our sons. So again, I'm going to pause there before I move on to looking at the surveys that we did with bereaved parents. So any questions, Doug? Uh, no, no questions yet. Okay. 
and we'll keep right on going then. So in terms of bereaved parents, so we had 50 parents complete our surveys, and these were parents who had a child die from cancer. It had to have been at least six months since that death happened. And we asked some of the same questions that we asked uh, families on active um, who are currently receiving care. So the first, you'll see the first um, at the bottom of the bars are the same questions, same subscale. So asking about relationships with health professionals, how parents were involved in care, the information being shared, support for other children. Then we asked a couple of uh, additional subscales around the support given to the parents in particular. So how often did health professionals give the right amount of support around practical, uh, emotional, spiritual, uh, physical support for the family, whether or not parents felt that they had a coach who was able to really guide them through their child's end of life care. And then we asked a group of questions about care at the time of death and whether or not they felt that they were prepared for their child's death, uh, were cultural, religious, spiritual practices respected, were any other wishes that parents might have respected? Would they describe their child's death as peaceful? And whether or not overall, all things considered, recognizing that a child's death is, is obviously a heartbreaking and traumatic experience, uh, whether or not parents could, could still look at, at the process as being a good death. And so you can see, again, that the support for siblings comes out as the lowest rated area. Another more specific question that we asked parents was around the idea of regrets. So with our sort of vision that the ultimate uh, high quality care and, and good palliative care for a parent over the last month of the child's life would be that eventually parents could look back on that period and say that they really had no regrets. So the bereaved parents in our study, uh, just over 50% are able to do that um, at least six months after their child's death. Say, you know, I look back on the whole process with no regrets, but of course that leaves almost 50% um, that do have some degree of regrets. And what kind of regrets do they have? So we followed that up with a question of, to tell us more about what actually were their regrets. So one parent said, I would have fought harder for him to have a better quality of care from home care nursing staff. I wish we could have had access to better equipment right from the beginning. I wish we had been better informed that his death was very imminent. If we had known earlier about her rare and aggressive form of ALL or leukemia, we might have foregone the third round, the third chemo round in order to have made the end of her life a bit more comfortable. His location, we wanted to be home. But as parents and siblings, it was hard to know what to expect with having a seizure, how we would deal with it. Fear of dealing with the pain he would suffer. So it was easier to be near nurses and doctors. No nurse could be found to attend our community, to be with us at our home if he was brought home. And then finally, a parent said, I regret we were not really ever able to get ahead of his pain for more than a short period of time. So certainly lots of areas uh, for potential improvement uh, that can be looked at sort of going forward. And then just another overall comment, so again at the end of the survey with the bereaved parents we asked, um, you know, is there anything else you want to tell us? And so one parent said, we were extremely lucky to have been connected with the palliative care team just hours after our daughter's diagnosis. However, this connection was only made after a close family friend who knew people in that team advocated for it. The hospital did not offer this to us. My biggest concern is for families who receive a cancer diagnosis that is usually fatal, even if the person can live more than a year after diagnosis, and they are not connected with palliative care until it is clear there is nothing more to be done. The whole philosophy of this type of care needs to be made available to families just after diagnosis so that there is time to develop a full, trusting relationship with the caregivers. I still feel there is too much focus on treatments as opposed to quality of life. Make sure your healthcare staff are not afraid to mention death to families and to talk to them about palliative care early on in their child's illness. So this, um, we could have written this quote ourselves, I think, actually, to, uh, 
to fit with all the things that we believe about palliative care and certainly with how we really set up uh, this project to some degree and our, our beliefs about the involvement of palliative care both as a team, uh, but also as Adam said at the beginning, that it's the philosophy um, that we really believe needs to be incorporated right from the beginning. Uh, so the, sorry, the other piece, just because one of the, the big things that came out from parents, from the bereaved parents about their regrets was around location of death. So we did ask a question specifically about that. And so this graph represents uh, the preferred location of death versus the actual location of death. So you can see 50% of the bereaved parents had their child die at home and that was where they wanted to be. On the other hand, in terms of hospitals, certainly some families want to be in the hospital. So sort of 22, 23% actually said that, that, that that's where they were and that's where they wanted to be. But there is that red bar above that. So certainly there were families whose child died in hospital that that really was not um, where they had planned to be. And then hospice. So not every site um, that has an oncology program has a hospice, and we'll look at that a bit more in a minute. Uh, but when a hospice is available, certainly some families do want to be there. Uh, but again, some families find themselves there, and it may not be actually the place that they would prefer to be. So a brief stop, pause again, Doug, if there's any questions. There, uh, the questions have started coming in finally. So <laughs> um, you were uh, Mary is asking about uh, when you were speaking about the siblings experience. She was just wondering what did parents suggest to improve the siblings experience or did they make any suggestions? Um, they, there weren't any specific suggestions um, from the open-ended comments that I remember. Um, it's just an area that parents tend to rate low. But it's, I mean, the questions that we ask parents that they're saying they're not getting is the piece around both direct support for the siblings, so health professional, professionals actually interacting with the siblings themselves, but also just that coaching piece. So, I mean, sometimes siblings don't ever actually come to the hospital. They never meet the health professionals. So coaching parents on how to go back home and talk to their, their other kids about what's happening. Uh, those are the kinds of things we asked about that parents said they were not um, getting. All right. The, 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 the next question was about um, sort of access to information from the parents' perspective. You, you, that was one of the the, the, the pieces of data that you were displaying in the graph. One of the parents' comments specifically talked about uh, when they're not an inpatient, they feel they, they don't really know what's going on so much. Uh, is there a role for, I mean, we often talk about electronic health records and when it comes to that access to information, particularly when the parents are not in school and, and children with complex chronic illness that are constantly moving around and, and that whole issue of parents having access to information, test results and on and on and on. Is there a role or has it been talked about the whole role? I mean, there's obviously a role for electronic health records, but is that something that people think think might be an opportunity to sort of address some of these access to information issues that parents are having and that whole issue of, of, of a good quality electronic health record with a parent or a patient portal component, et cetera? Um, so th this was not something that we got into. We didn't uh, really solicit ideas from parents about what they think should be done. Um, and it's not something that at this baseline level that we've even given a lot of thought to, but I, I think that's an area that stands out for us, and there are a lot of people looking at things like portals or passports. Um, there are specific things that have been done to try to keep families uh, integrated and, and sort of involved in care even when they are an outpatient. So for example, in the province of Ontario, we have interlink nurses that continue to maintain contact with the families, um, but I'm not sure that those things are available everywhere. So at this point, we're really reporting what families feel or where there's areas that, are, that there could be improvements. And then our plan is to look closely at what's been done in, in certain areas and to sort of brainstorm, uh, you know, what could be done to improve this. But I, I think your point is well taken, Doug, that with the, the growing role of technology and specifically electronic health records, um, you know, th th these records really do belong to the patients and, and, and their, um, their legal guardians and their, their parents in this case. And I think uh, giving them some kind of access 
uh, is A, something that they would want, uh, and, and I, I think these things don't necessarily have to be hidden, but B, because so many of these kids and families don't live in you know, the, the immediate vicinity of the tertiary care center, when something goes wrong, they often end up in their community institution. And um, I, I think having the ability to share information with those uh, institutions that is extremely important, relevant, up to date, is something that we need to look at. And I know that there have been national efforts to do so with EACHIM. I, I think these things are only getting stronger, um, but I, I think we need to leverage these things even more. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Donna. She's saying, limited support to other children seems to be a trend in, in your study. Uh, what do you attribute this to? Uh, is her first question. And then she goes on to ask, are child life specialists participating in the teams? Are members of the healthcare team comfortable with how to utilize their non-medical team members, such as child life specialists, social workers, chaplains, uh, et cetera, to better support other children? Yeah, so I don't, we didn't actually have a child life specialist on any of the regional teams. And that's partly because you saw the long list of modules that are really focused on pain and symptom management. And so for a child life uh, specialist to come in and have to learn that piece as part of the becoming a trainer sort of doesn't really make sense. Uh, but we'll be talking in a few minutes about the, some of the quality improvement projects. And two of the 16, uh, 15 sites actually decided to focus on sibling support. Uh, and they did get other team members then involved in that process when they got back home uh, to help choose what kinds of books and resources information would be given to families. One uh, decided to focus on the resources and support that are pr provided for families at diagnosis to support the other kids. And one of the sites actually chose to focus more on the grief of children, so looking at getting more resources for kids after their child with cancer has died. I think the other way that uh, we are incorporating some of the uh, members of the interprofessional team that, that were listed, Doug, in the question is they, they are certainly participating as what we call end users in the EPIC education. So as Kim said, they weren't part of the regional teams, but um, they are represented in the audience of uh, specific lectures as part of the EPIC PEDS rollout in each of the regions, uh, we, we're seeing that trend. I think another way to interpret that question uh, could be, you know, do we know what their involvement is? Uh, with, with these sort of r reports coming in from families uh, in our baseline data, do we know what the, these uh, various centers, how they're using their child life specialists and um, other, uh, you know, chaplains, et cetera, to improve the quality of care and support given to families, siblings, etc. cetera, we, we do not know that. So we just ask the broad question, and I think this is the kind of thing that we're going to have to uh, think about in areas and, and make recommendations about, because obviously these are members of the larger interprofessional team that I, I think play a very important role at increasing the height of these bars in, in, you know, in the slides that we've shown you. Um, and, and so again, I think that while we haven't asked about it specifically, this is something that we're going to definitely be wondering about out loud and, and uh, you know, pointing out the role that these individuals could play on these interprofessional teams. So it's a, it's a very important question that's being asked. Thank you very much for that. Uh, definitely, uh, I should warn you, the, the child life specialist component of our audience is a very significant and passionate component of our audience on these webinars. So there's, there's often lots of input from our child life specialists, which is always great. So they're, I'm sure they're happy to hear that. Um, the, la the last comment that we have for now before we, uh, we can move on with the presentations from Marley, and she's, this is in reference to talking about the uh, 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 being at home versus being at the hospital um, question that you'd put up or slide that you'd put up. Uh, she's just saying that preference for hospital may well be because parents realize that symptom management at home may be problematic due to a lack of resources. Um, any comment on that? Uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's why we wanted to ask families about where they want to be. So I think there's a push more so in adult palliative care that the best place to be is home and that that should be our goal. But in fact, some families don't want to be at home. They actually want to be in hospital. 
what we need to tease out a bit more, I think, is why do they want to be in hospital? And that, I think, came through in some of those questions from, from parents. Sometimes the reason they want to be in hospital is because, yes, they're worried about the symptoms that might happen at home. Home care is not um, well established and in place that they feel comfortable that they can stay at home and manage the symptoms that they might expect their child to have. And so we do need to make sure that families who want to be at home can be at home, but not to see it as a failure if a family, for whatever reason, really wants to be in hospital. That our, our goal is not to have every family have their child die at home. Our goal is to have every family have their child be cared for and die in the location that they want. So I hope that, that addresses that piece. And Marley commented she totally agrees. So, <laughs> so with, with that, we've got that's the end of the questions for now. We I think we have a couple more coming in now, but maybe it's, this is a good time to move on with the presentation, and we'll come back to some of these other questions at the end. Sure, that sounds good. So the last piece that we had evaluated in terms of the quality of care was doing chart reviews. So we did chart reviews on all the children who died during a. I believe it was a year, just over a year time frame. So that was 200 charts across the 10 sites. And one of the things, we looked at quite a few different things. Where I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. So one of the pieces is around this location of death. And so looking at where kids die. So 15% of them dying in the ICU, almost 25% dying at home, or sorry, in the inpatient unit, a few in the emergency room. You'll notice the percentage dying at home from the chart reviews is only 30, just under 30%, whereas from the bereaved parent surveys, it was actually 50%. And so that shows a bit of a bias in who responded to our surveys. So of course, a chart review, you get a 100% response rate because you can review every single chart. When you send out surveys to bereaved parents, not all of them fill them out, unfortunately. Um, of course, that's their choice and their right to decide whether or not to fill it out. Um, but it does show that we probably heard from more families who actually had their child die at home than what would be um, typically seen in this population. And then as well, you see in terms of hospice deaths, almost 20%. Other hospital means that they died in a, not the sort of tertiary center where the pediatric oncology program is based, but died in a hospital, maybe a community hospital that was closer to their home. Sorry, we seem to be sticking for a moment. Um, perhaps if you just click on the center of the screen, it may... Uh... I think it's a computer thing, sorry. No, that's all right. There we go. Did we miss one, though? No, that's right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, the kids' computers. <laughs> there, we'll go back. There we go. All right. So again, because we have a, a large enough number here, we can do a bit of a breakdown by site. So again, I talked about you know our goal is not to have every child die at home. We want them to die where they want to die. But at the same time, if you look across the different sites, so home are the blue bars, red are the hospice death bars, and green are the hospital bars. So you can see there's quite a bit of variation across the country. Uh, like I said, there's not a hospice at every site, but at at least three of the four sites here that have a hospice, when that hospice is available, most of the kids actually die there. That's the largest um, group in terms of location of death. Then you have some sites like Site 8, where the vast majority um, die in the hospital, and then Site 5, where actually the majority of kids die at home. So again, just sort of a benchmarking thing for sites to maybe think about uh, in terms of what supports are there for their families to be at home, are families supported to actually be where they want to be. Another piece that we looked at is palliative, around palliative care team involvement. So again, there's no magic number, does the palliative care team need to see every single child who dies from cancer? No. Um, 
But again, benchmarking across the country, there are a couple of sites where they do. Every single child who died uh, at site four or site five actually had a consult to the pediatric palliative care team. And that goes down to site seven, as you can see, where just under 70% of the kids actually saw the palliative care team. But where I think the, the bigger differences come out is when that referral actually happens. So much more variation across the country. And you'll also note that a couple of the sites where 100% of the kids are seen, in that 100%, some of them are seen very late. So this is a number of days before death that that referral actually happens. So you can see site two, 140 days before death is when, um, is the median time before death that, that kids see the palliative care team, all the way down to site seven where it's less than 20 days before the death. So again, no magic number, and obviously it's very dependent on the child's situation and condition, um, but maybe show some, some of what might be possible. Uh, along the same line, we wanted to look at advanced care planning or talking about goals of care. And so you can see that there was document documentation of advanced care planning across um, some variation across the site. Some of them, 100% of, of the kids do have some type of advanced care planning documented in their chart. Uh, but again, this is often done quite late. So less than 40 days for the most part. Um, but again, site two seems to be able to, their, and it maybe is their palliative care team gets involved very early and brings up these conversations much earlier than might be done at some of the other sites. So a stop there, I think, uh, in terms of any comments about what stands out. That's sort of the, the end of the data related to quality of palliative care that we've collected so far. So any questions or comments? Um, I'd like to know which site is site number two. They really seem to be uh, ahead, of the, ahead of the curve on this, uh, a lot of this stuff. But uh, uh, do, do you have any data to correlate, like to identify that that site is really re represents a best practice model, like not being able to say who it is, but did, are, were you able to, to sort of correlate their sort of early intervention with outcomes at all? We haven't really done that yet. We want to get the, the data from the other five sites to pull all of that piece in. Um, and I probably can't say too much. It would probably identify the site. So, so we will be looking at that in terms of running some statistics that will, you know, if, if a site has X, does that mean that overall they sort of score better or do better than other sites? Um, but we haven't done that part yet. All right. Yeah, actually, a question, a similar question just came in. Uh, Marley's asking, will there be an opportunity to learn from the outliers? I think both the ones that are the outliers in early intervention or or or, or the other end of the spectrum, or, and not just the early intervention, but all of these things. But on, there, so that, that it is likely that there will be an opportunity to learn from the outliers just in your further analysis of the data. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Leah. Uh, put it in a question earlier about uh, is there a difference uh, related to the uh, death at home versus in the hospital? Is there a difference of perception from parents uh, of a good death if death occurs at home versus the hospital? Um, so that's another sub analysis. We're going to take notes on all the other sub analyses we need to do here, but um, that hasn't been looked at. I'm trying to think in other studies. It's more about the match between death happening where they want it to happen and having the opportunity to make those plans. Even if they plan to have the death happen in hospital, it's the opportunity to plan the location of death that seems to be more important than where the actual death happens. And is there any data to indicate whether parents are making, and I'll put in quotes, the, the right choice of whether at home versus hospital? For example, making the choice to uh, have the death at home, but then regretting that, realizing it was harder than they thought or didn't have the resources or weren't as prepared as they thought they would be. Is there any sort of data to suggest that parents are, are making the, 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 again, in quotes, the right choice about home versus hospital? Well, I guess the only thing I can go back to is the slide about planned or preferred location with actual location. And so for all the deaths that happened at home, that was where people wanted to be and that's where they ended up being. 
as opposed to the hospital, not everybody wanted to be there. As well, the regrets were, no, there were nobody in sort of the long answers um, said, you know, I really regretted being at home. Mm-hmm. It was the other way around. I regretted not being at home enough, but that was sometimes because there were no resources. Like it sounded like a death at home was really not an option because there was nobody there to support them, and so they had to be in the hospital. Or it was perceived not to be an option, I think, right. is the other thing. I, I, I'm not sure that's always the case, but uh, for whatever reason, families have sort of come to the conclusion, this isn't going to work for us. Either it doesn't work for the way our family is, or we don't believe that we could get the supports that we would require at this time. Mm-hmm. And, and that perception is, re- is really key. I mean, it doesn't matter what reality is, it's their perception is really what's important here. But um, I, I so, think that's... And I, the, the thing to add to that, Doug, is especially when you think about the fact that we're focusing in on kids with cancer, these are children who um, often are not getting a lot of um, home nursing support during their cancer treatment. Um, you know, that a lot of the treatment is in the hospital coming to clinic. Uh, when it's outpatient treatment and they're taking oral chemotherapeutic agents, they often don't require home nursing. So this is not a group of children and families that are used to what the community can provide, uh, as opposed perhaps to some of the families of, of kids who have children with chronic complex neurologic impairment who are, are hopefully very used to what a community can provide to help them live at home. Um, and so I think there is, a, there is this perception for a lot of families of kids with cancer we could never do what we, you know, we can never sort of duplicate that kind of support that we get in hospital in our home community. And, and perhaps it's because they've just never been exposed to it. But I, I think that speaks to the role of um, the, the individuals at the hospital, the team members in the hospital, including palliative care team members, who, whose function is to really help families understand this is what it would look like, this is what we can provide. That really sort of sparked something as you were saying that. I mean, that's a really good distinction between kids with cancer versus, uh, you know, a, fa- a family that's that has a child with a long-term complex chronic medical, uh, crit- you know, complex medical illness where, you know, they may have a period of 5, 10, 15, 20 years to, to deal with services in the community and understanding what's available to them, et cetera, et cetera. So any thoughts about how... You know, as this sort of information translates out of the the cancer world across to the rest of the palliative care spectrum, how, how do you perceive this being different like when when we're talking not about kids with cancer, but about kids who and families who have more experience, you know, in a longer progression through their sort of disease process and more experience in the community, other service providers, rehab centers, or children's treatment centers in Ontario involved. You know, is there there, there must, I mean, I think ideally, I guess, there would be an effort to educate and, and bring all of those providers into this sort of epic uh, education process as well. You're, you're stealing our thunder. That's part of our next step. So that, that's something that we believe is really important because keep in mind, uh, international data has shown us, and, and certainly this is our experience here in Toronto, that uh, the percentage of referrals to palliative care service, pediatric palliative care services of children with cancer is usually less than 25%. The bulk of the the children and families that we work with are in fact children with chronic complex neurologic conditions that are either uh, congenital or acquired in nature. And so I I think this is a big area that we have to focus on. It's one that Kim and I would have loved to have explored, um, but the funding opportunity, you know, comes specifically with uh, you know, focusing in on this cancer population. But that's absolutely something that we'd like to do in next steps. I think at, th- at this time, all we can do is sort of wonder together and, and think about those important differences like the ones that I, that I had just suggested. And, and I think there could be many more, Doug. All right. Um, and uh, Morgan put in a, a comment on, sort of, re- sort of related to this, a comment on Twitter uh, asking if there are any plans going forward for a greater collaboration with child life specialists, both in hospital and community. And I think based on this recent conversation we were just having, that that's obviously going to be the case. Yeah, we, we think so, Morgan. We, we think that uh, the work that child life specialists do are, uh, it's so important for enhancing aspects of it. So we're really hoping that the, the data that we're collecting sort of, you know, helps spur that. And, and uh, if, if, 
if our project team can be a part of promoting that, well, that would be fantastic. All right, so that's, the, that's all the questions for now, so on with the presentation. Okay, so um, I promised you that we would come back to tell you a little bit about a little bit more about how we've been doing with respect to achieving our goals. And so you might remember this pyramid that I showed before. Um, our hope was to actually uh, get five master facilitators across Canada, and sure enough, we have accomplished that. So these individuals uh, went through not only training to become EPIC trainers, they uh, did professional development workshops in Chicago, and, uh, and they went through a sort of um, an educational teaching that, that comes with the Epic Peach curriculum. They had to get feedback from other master facilitators. So you get coaching and mentorship before you can get that label of master facilitator. And uh, we do have representation uh, from across Canada of five master facilitators. We did, uh, we've managed to actually create 72 Epic PEDS certified trainers from across 15 centers. So again, in these two areas, we've, uh, we've hit our target, which we're really happy about. And if people remember, uh, the bottom part of the uh, pyramid is that we were hoping that these trainers would then go back to their regions and reach, a, a, we were aiming for 600 end users. And again, end users are people that would then be educated by this Epic Peds curriculum. And our target was 600 across the country. You remember all those dots? And I'm really pleased to say that to date, and it's not over yet, we are over 1,500 end users across Canada. So we've really uh, exceeded our expectations. And, and keep in mind also that uh, that target was created when we were looking at 16 sites, uh, and we only got 15, which is really exciting for us. If you remember, we wanted to look at health professionals' knowledge, so uh, we do ask health professionals um, who attend as end users, who attend these, train, uh, these educational sessions, the questions that you can see here, um, and asking them, you know, was it useful, do you think it's going to improve their practice, etc. And, and there is, of course, at, you know, evidence in the educational literature that, that this data has limited importance, but I think it's still, uh, you know, in terms of long-term practice changes, but I think it's still necessary to collect. And you can see that our, our mean scores at a four are um, all above three. So I, I think this, that healthcare professionals who participate in these educational sessions are saying that this is having some kind of impact on their knowledge. Um, and then finally, we wanted to see if this is, in fact, leading to practice changes. And, and we wanted to look specifically at these QI initiatives. So I'll, I'll just remind all of you that a heavy component of the face-to-face -face workshop was emphasis on going back to your region and implementing some QI initiative that you and your regional team identified as being something that would be important. And so seven of the regional teams said that they were going to look at symptom screening, Four of the sites said they wanted to do things in bereavement follow-up. Um, two sites actually said, and this was before the baseline data was collected, that they wanted to improve uh, the sibling support that they give. So that's exciting for us given the fact that uh, we're finding that this is an area of, uh, of need. Um, uh, one site said they were going to work together to get increased referrals to the pediatric palliative care team. And one site actually identified mouth care as being an important problem uh, and, and one that was really affecting the quality of life for children and families uh, in their institution that were dealing with cancer. So these are the ones that they, they identified themselves. And I'll tell you, um, do, we, do we know roughly how many are successful? I'm just thinking when we've had our calls. I can say it's been variable. Um, all of them are in sort of the process of rolling them out. Some are, have gone further than others. Some are having troubles getting off the ground, um, and it, it's been quite variable. From our perspective, that is our project team and, and Kim and myself, these are some of the highs and lows so far of the project. Um, so one of the highs is that uh, the patient's reports of the symptoms and uh, how cancer affects their quality of life seems to generally fit with the norms that the literature reports internationally. So again, I think that speaks to the fact that our samples uh, are generally representative of what we, what, what's described in the medical literature. Um, unfortunately, I think uh, you know, we're finding that quality of life seems to be something that is not routinely assessed as reported by children and families. 
On a positive note, the quality of care in general uh, scores fairly high. So families uh, are reporting that, that they feel that the care that they're getting during active treatment and, and into bereavement is, is pretty good. Um, but as we've noted a couple times, the support for siblings is the lowest rated um, issue, uh, area. A high proportion of families are being uh, followed by and referred to palliative care, and we think that that's great. Um, again, uh, I, I think that the timing of those referrals perhaps could be improved. Um, I, I think that uh, there, there is a, a nice body of literature that shows uh, what earlier referrals can do and how it can improve uh, not only the quality of death, but in fact the quality of life for children and families when palliative care is integrated earlier. Um, again, a large uh, proportion die in hospice when this option is available, and as Kim mentioned, hospice is not available everywhere. Um, but uh, hospital is not the preferred location for a third of families whose children actually die there. And I think that that's an area that, that needs to be addressed and, and sort of thought about and worked on perhaps. So the journey does continue. Uh, we are completing our education rollout. In fact, um, the, the sort of collection of data for Epic Peds education comes to an end in September 2016, so we're getting there. A few of the centers are making a last minute push in the summer. Uh, we're hoping to encourage many more of these sites to implement and in fact complete their QI projects. We're going to complete post-intervention data collection in October 2016. We recognize that this is a short time from our pre-data collection, pre-intervention collection. We know that, that um, it takes a lot of time for an educational initiative to actually have the impact on practice. And we are very grateful again to our funding agency, CPAC. They get that too. I don't think we're expecting to see major changes in the palliative care received by children and families. But we recognize we need to start just collecting this data. We're never going to show that there's any change unless we start collecting it. And so that's what's going on right now. And we are planning a final project meeting with representatives from all the sites as well as our partner organizations, including CAFC, in January 2017. And uh, if my computer moves on, there we go. Uh, we're, we're basically, I think we've reached the end of our hour and a half, and we're glad that people have been asking questions along the way. But uh, Kim and I do have a few minutes if anybody wants to provide any other thoughts or feedback. All right. Well, thank you. When we finish just in time, as it looks like your uh, your computer is just uh, on its last legs, uh, shuffling through the end here. Um, but we did have one more question that came in, and we'll maybe use the last, as you mentioned, the last couple of minutes to just take this one last question. Uh, Carla's asking um, if you had any thoughts about cultural, religious, or ethnic aspects that might have had an impact on your data, as well as on the Epic Kids program for training international health professionals. Has any thought been given to that whole cultural? national component to this? So we do ask the parents who complete the surveys about their cultural background and a few questions, ask whether or not the care provided sort of fit um, with that. Uh, and again, sorry to be honest, we haven't done that kind of a sub-analysis to see if there, are any, that if there are any differences. Uh, so we will be doing that piece. Yeah, I'm sorry, Doug, the second part of the question? Asking about the Epic Kids uh, training program for like uh, using it for international health professionals or or people in international locations that are looking to access this information and, and its relevance in, in in other cultures internationally. Yeah, so that's a great question. That goes beyond uh, the scope of our project, but Kim and I are, are sort of knowledgeable about some of the Epic Peds efforts. There are lots of great efforts going on right now. Uh, it was recently done in Australia and New Zealand. Um, there is a group that is doing Epic Peds Latin America, and that's rolling it out now in South America. And I, I think that's just the beginning. Stefan Friedrichsdorf, who again is sort of, I, I call him the father of Epic Pediatrics. Um, he, he's got his eyes set on uh, Australia. There's going to be, a, a, excuse me, Africa, and there's going to be uh, perhaps an initiative in uh, India and, and that area of the world um, in, in the next year or two. So I, I think it remains to be seen, but, uh, but I know that uh, Epic Peds, the brand, is working with local champions because I, I think just like Kim and I adapted it 
for to, to try to make it work better in, in Canada, we see that that's what they're doing in every region. And again, um, that was one of the things that drew us to Epic Peds, that there is this flexibility allowed. They recognize that the Epic Peds model as it was conceived in the U.S. may not be the right model everywhere. And so it's being translated, it's being adapted to make it work better. And just one last question. This one hopefully will be quick before we wrap up. Um, the, the, the question is, are end, user, end users at, the, at their site are, being, are asking about receiving a certification after completing the modules of Epic Peds? Do you know, what, what's happening along those lines as far as getting a, any kind of an official certification? So Epic trainers get that official trainer status, and, and master facilitators do as well. End users, uh, think of end users as people who attend a lecture. Um, and, and the lecture might be on neuropathic pain or it might be on grief and bereavement support. Any one of those modules uh, that I showed you before um, are, are taught and uh, some of the groups are, are teaching them in bunches and making workshops and those workshops might give some kind of certification. A lot of these are doing, being done as sort of one-off lectures using the EPIC materials. And, um, you know, for the most part, there's no sort of official status. Just as you might attend a hospital rounds on a specific topic and, and you wouldn't necessarily leave with any kind of certificate uh, other than the fact that you might sign in for CME training if, uh, if there is some kind of um, uh, acknowledgement there. So the, the, the short answer is no. There is no sort of uh, specific certification that I've been in. Uh, an Epic Pediatric end user. And I, I think that's because it's so variable. We can give certification to trainers and master facilitators because we know at the end they all sort of come out the same with the same training. End users are, you know, what they get depends on what that trainer exposed them to. And uh, because it's so variable, um, you know, we, we don't know exactly what it is. And I think for that reason, Epic won't, you know, create an official certification. All right, and I think with that, I think we'll wrap it up. And we'll just give you one one more uh, minute uh, on the microphone. Just any anything you'd like to close the session off with? Any any sort of key messages you'd like to leave the audience with before we wrap up? Well, I, I think we didn't have too much time to go into it today, but I, I think one of the things that has been most profound for Kim and I and our uh, project team collaborators and members has been uh, just the experiences across the country. It's been so exciting for us to see how much this project has invigorated centers. As I alluded to at the beginning, there are centers that didn't even have pediatric palliative care programs that as a result of this initiative have now come up with systems to get palliative care consultation from adult uh, providers in their region. There are new partnerships forming. For some of these regional teams, this was the first opportunity to have pediatric palliative care and oncology at the same table. You might think that would be a slam dunk, that this is a natural partnership, but it hasn't been the case everywhere. And it's been really exciting for us just to see these relationships flourishing. And then, of course, this commitment, as you saw with our numbers, to really get this out there. So that's, that, I think, more than anything, has been the, the most rewarding part for Kim and I and the most exciting part of this project for that and I think with that we'll, we'll wrap up I and mean, it's, it's great to see so much excitement around this uh, palliative care for, especially for children has been such an underserved uh, sort of service uh, across Canada we brought it to our, our the CAFC conference last year in Quebec City with I think Dr. Widger was with us uh, along with some other uh, leaders in the field across Canada so it's great that we were able to bring it to our conference and continue bringing it to the CAFC community because there's so much interest in this information so thank you very much for bringing you know, a great presentation a great resource I'm sure everyone's looking forward to all of this future analysis that people were talking talking about and looking for what's uh, what's to come next from from your work. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. So, all right, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and it's always great when you can watch live as those questions in the discussion really, or and comments really enrich the discussion. But uh, when you can't watch live, as I mentioned, we do record the whole session, and you can always go back after the fact and watch it on the on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, next week, we'll, we are going to be having an update from CAFC's uh, Interfacility Transport of Critically Ill Neonatal Maternal and Pediatric Patients Committee and their work in standards de development. We're going to hear from Kate Mann and Dr. Alan DeCon, the co-chair 
years of that work. Uh, as we wrap up eight years of work on standardizing transport knowledge and practice across the country, and we're also going to hear from Stephanie Carpenter from Accreditation Canada to learn how that work has been translated into standards that have been embedded into the hospital accreditation program uh, that's delivered by Accreditation Canada. And then following that, we're going to be hearing a, once again from one of CAFC's community of practice, uh, this time in uh, the community of practice in children's pain. And that session is going to uh, provide a brief background of what that community of practice has been doing and how the, the toolkits they developed and how they were created. They're going to talk about some exemplars of how specific toolkits might be used and focus on examples from the field where individuals and organizations have been successful in implementing and supporting practice change related to pediatric pain uh, as management and assessment practices. Uh, so it's going to be a great session. Once again, a, a great opportunity to showcase some of the work uh, that uh, is being led uh, by our, our leaders within the CAFC community. So some great stuff coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. And thanks again for joining us today. A great audience today with lots of great questions. And we hope to see all of you back here next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye.